Yes, sir. Yes, sir. We in the building. Today, I'm here with a very special guest, a very special guest, DJ Grandmaster Scratch. Yeah, yeah. He needs no introduction. How you feeling today, sir? Good. Feeling good, man. How about you, Fizzy? Fizzy I'm feeling films good. in the house. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I'm feeling real good. I'm uh, very happy to be here. Um, happy to finally be able to put this together. Yeah, buddy. Okay, so let's get straight into it. Um, so you're from... Richmond, California. Yes, sir. Okay. Born, and, born and bred. What was it like growing up in Richmond? Man, it was good, man. You know what I mean? And, um, I was born in 68, leading up to the 80s, you know, being a teenager or whatnot. It was good, you know, diverse community growing up in Hilltop, you know what I mean? It wasn't too bad. Richmond was, Richmond was still young at that point. You know what I mean? So it was a good life. By young, what exactly do you mean? Yeah, young mean, uh, you know, I got into DJing at like, you know, 12 years old. You know what I mean? Born in 1968. So you started DJing when you were 12. How did you get into that? Yeah, me and my homeboys, you know, ACP Productions, my little crew, you know what I mean? E-Baby, Chili D. And DJ Saint, you know what I mean? We start trying to emulate Run DMC. We wanted to be like all the people we admire from New York, the Bronx, where hip hop was born. You know what I mean? Trying to be like the greats, you know what I mean? I started off with a little beatbox. We all had beatbox, we used to all carry them around. You know what I mean? Mine had speakers that came off and I had like a little quarter inch jack. I came out of that, hooked it up to a turntable. I started mixing tape and CD, I mean, and tape and uh, records, you know what I mean, at the time. You know what I mean? So that's how we started building our little HCP productions and, you know, making our little beats and rapping. You know what I mean? That's where it all started at. Was there any other group in Richmond or even the Bay Area at the time that were involved in DJ, um, you know, production work? Things of that nature? Yeah, yeah. You know, at the time we had the uh, the two shorts, the E-40s, the Calvin T's, you know what I mean? Everybody's bubbling at that time, you know what I mean? The rapping Fotes, you know what I mean? So we all trying to be like them and trying to be, you know, just as seasoned as them, you know, because they was coming with some real heat at the time, you know what I mean? So we wanted to be on that caliber as far as my HTP production crew. That's where it was going, you know what I mean? Okay, and from there, you guys are starting out. What's the next move look like? The next move is coming, you know what I mean? My homeboy Vaughn, we going around, we buying records, DJ Saint, we going to Leopold's, T's of my Uzi's, Tower Records. Next thing you know, Master P come with this little record store in Richmond called No Limit Records. And my homeboy Vaughn, you know, he was more out there buying records a little bit more than me because I'm in, I'm in the workforce at that point. You know what I mean? So I'm like at a career type of job. So I'm like loving hip hop, but I'm like saying, you know, if it happened, it happened, but you know, at least I could pay my bills type of shit. So uh, my homeboy Vaughn, DJ Saint, he come and tell me that, you know, Master P is looking for a DJ. This guy got a no limit record store. And so I go down there and uh, Vaughn introduced me to him and it just started clicking right away. You know what I mean? We started um, cooking up, you know, trying to see what we was going to do. You know, we started recording a little bit. You know, he had like a little makeshift studio, you know what I mean? And, uh, he had a couple of little artists, like an R&B chick, and, uh, her husband, you know, he was singing a little R&B. We was putting a little stuff together. Master P had a little computer, and uh, it was going cool, but it was like, I had met this guy, you know, through one of my co-workers named Marvin Webb, may he rest in peace. He took me to K. Lou's, and so... Um, when I seen K. Lou Studio, I was like, you know, really impressed because I'm already really heavy in the game at that point. So 
I'm telling Master P, I mean, I, I'm not telling Master Tom, but I'm looking at what we're doing, and I'm just like saying to myself, you know, I got, I know a guy with a real studio, you know what I mean? So, uh, make a long story short, we went from that little tinkered around, took him to uh, K. Lou's, we finished out the little project that we started off, which was called uh, What's the Deal? It's the first What's the Deal tape, you know what I'm talking about? And we did uh, one joint with the little R&B singers. You know, it was called uh, Why You Do What You Do. We had another cut called uh, What's The Deal. That's the title track. Then we had a song called No Limit. That was like the most bangingest track on the, on the uh, CD. You know what I mean? So we finished a little bit of those projects off at of K. Lou's and then we came up with the, uh, you know, guys was hanging out in the record store. We came up with the Untouchables, you know what I mean? It was me and Master P. You know, I was trying to be a general, not a soldier, initially when we when we first hooked up. You know, I had like a little contract and everything, you know what I mean, where when I start seeing it moving, I came with a little bit of bread, and then, you know, we kept it moving. That's how we was able to go to K Lou's. You know, but we we created the untouchables and then it just kept moving from there. You know, what I mean I brought in some of my clique. My homeboy Chili D, Big O was hanging out at the store. King George, he came a little bit later after we had made a couple of two or three tracks. You know what I mean? He came from New Orleans. But uh, yeah, and initially it was, it was just me and Master P trying to be like, you know, Eric B and Rock Kim or, you know, Jazzy Jeff and the Fresh Prince. And then we created the Untouchables. You know what I mean? It started organically like that. And then it progressed to the Untouchables. You know, Silk the Shocker, C. Murder, none of them dudes was around. You know what I mean? It was just DJ G M E Z and Master P at that point. You know what I mean? That's how it all organically started. Yeah. <laughs> Lots to digest there. Yeah. <laughs> so you met Master P before you met K. Lou? Yes, sir. Okay. And... You met K. Lou through your coworker, or was it Master P that you met through your coworker? No, I met um, K. Lou through my coworker. Met K. Lou. Okay. Yeah. Okay. This guy uh, Marvin Webb and K. Lou, they went to school together. It was like maybe four or five years older than me. You know what I mean? So I gave Marvin Webb, you know, a ride home from work here and there. He was like, knew I was into music. He introduced me to K. Lou. Yeah. So that was like maybe. Six months or, you know, a year prior to me meeting Master P. You know what I mean? So it happened pretty quick, basically. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It sounds like you and Master P developed a pretty close relationship during that time in those early days. I heard you mention something about a contract. Yeah. What was that about? Yeah, like I said, when I first got with him, and he had the, uh, the record store. I was impressed by that, because you know what I mean? A lot of record stores we used to go to, you know, a lot of them were black owned. You know, this is a young, young brother, you know, got his own store, or whatever, you know what I mean? He got the cash register, blah, blah, blah. So I was impressed with that. So, I mean, when we first made the What's the Deal tape, I was like, you know, I seen he was kind of serious, you know what I mean? So that's why I said, I need to come with a contract, you know. My dad, you know, he was a musician. And when um, Master P would come by the house, my dad kind of sensed, you know, he, he had that little, little swag about him. And he was like, you know, uh, if you deal with this guy, you might want to get a contract. So my dad kind of influenced me to do that. You know, he went to, the, to school. You know, he, he studied music and this and that, you know what I mean? So I took his, took his advice, you know what I mean? So... That was a good move, you know what I mean? But, man, my dad, rest in peace, but yeah, he gave me that advice. Did he help you come up with the contract, or did you have to source that somewhere else? He kind of helped me come up with it, you know what I mean? Um, I called a couple of lawyers, you know, to get it, you know, get the penmanship right, you know what I mean? But um, I had my witness, he had his witness. It was like a binding contract, you know what I mean? It was humble beginnings, but like me being a DJ, I'm looking at all the record covers. I'm looking at who's the ex executive producer. Like I know I want to get my 
my my money, you know what I mean, at the end of the day. So it wasn't like I was sleeping on that. You know what I mean? I think after um we had, you know, disassembled, I think Master P, you know, he kinda took that little practice that I had kinda taught him with the with the contract. He never really came with contract. You know, he went to University of Houston. He was a little bit gamed up than us when he came to California because he got a you know basketball scholarship to go to the University of Houston. So that was like, you know, he had a little bit more game on us when it came to doing business. You know what I mean? But um, I know he got a little game from me too, a lot of game, you know what I mean? So, yeah, I mean, he tried to leave us out of the loop, you know what I mean? But uh, I was one of the key factors, you know what I mean, in the whole No Limit saga from the very beginning. Please believe it. Let's talk a little bit more about that. In what ways did you carry rather than assist No Limit at that time? Shit. Driving around, I had a little mini truck. I used to be in a little clique called Icy Creations. It was a little mini truck mobbing through Oakland and Richmond. You know, I'm taking them to Soul Beat. We going to um, the CMC. Um, it was like a little low budget music channel. We doing interviews at KPOO. We doing shows at the Oakland Army Base. You know what I mean? I'm transporting. We doing. We trying to get signed up to Capitol Records at the time. You know what I mean? We doing. We we moving. You know what I mean? And I'm working at the same time. You know what I mean? So it was like, I was real instrumental in it. You know what I mean? Definitely. At what point in time did P's career start to? take off and you guys started to kind of part ways? Yeah, like I said, um, what happened with the um, Untouchables, when we got ready to sign up everybody, you know what I mean? We already made the tape. But, uh, <laughs> Untouchable tape. You know, I'm executive producer on this tape, by the way. But uh, we had like a little meeting in my apartment. And um, we got all the untouchables over here. I already signed the contract with P. You know what I mean? Everything is rolling. And um, my, home, my homie Chili D, he didn't really uh, agree with the terms of the uh, contract. So it was like, it went all bad. He was like, basically, fuck you, blah, blah, blah. They went all out, you know what I mean? It was just basically King George and Master P all my AC crew was, P, T, my ACP crew was still up in the, uh, my apartment. And so we looked down and um, he tried to, he lift up his shirt, like he tried to draw down on us, you know what I mean? All because uh, my dudes didn't want to sign the contract, you know what I mean? So So he tried to shug night you guys, basically. It word. <laughs> Damn. Okay. Yeah, it was crazy. Because we just getting started, you know what I mean? It's like. I think about the Scott Rocks, the Pop Smokes, Tupac, Biggie, all people that got, you know, caught up in this music industry. I'm like, here we go trying to just make a tape, boys out of Hilltop, Richmond, you know what I mean, trying to do our thing. And then uh, it, we have to run into this shit, you know what I'm saying? But it was mainly, you know, kind of pointed at my homeboy, Chili D, because he was the more body by the you know Bay Area cat and the crew. I mean I would have kept riding with Master P, but that was so disrespectful and we got guns too. So it's like, you know, it's hard to reverse that shit. You know what I'm saying? So he tried to leave niggas out the loop, but um that's how it went down. So you that was kinda mean? like the you know ice cream on top. Yeah. To kinda Okay. Yeah, word. So, so like go ahead, go ahead. No, nah, just like the ice cream, you mentioned that. But it's like him biting ice cream man and, you know, yuck mouth and the whole nine. You know what I mean? Like, when we got with Master P, we try to be organic. We try to be real original artists. But he biting, you know what I mean? We do Mind of a Psychopath. You know what I mean? He want to do Mind of a Lunatic. You know what I mean? Then, you know... You can't keep biting off these different artists. You do the ice cream man. No one that came from Oakland was born and bred in Oakland. You know what I mean? So that's another thing I didn't like about Master P. Even though 
I admire his hustle. I'm not taking nothing away from him as far as, you know, what he accomplished, you know what I mean? So, yeah, that's the real, I'm just telling my story, you know what I'm saying? Giving the real. <laughs> What was it about those terms in that contract that um, they didn't want to sign? Well, but basically the contract that we signed was to recoup the money and put it back into the business. That's what you do when you're trying to build a company. You know what I mean? So that's exactly what it states. That we're trying to sell tapes and 12-inch records and trying to recoup the money and put it back in and keep it moving. And that's why we came up with the untouchable tape. And that's what you keep doing. You keep recouping and you keep, you know, putting it back into your business. That's how you blow up. You know what I mean? We was out the trunk. You know what I mean? I was selling CDs at my job. And niggas that thought I made it then, but it was like, Nah, we ain't, we ain't got no platinum records yet, you know what I'm saying? But uh, <laughs> hopefully we get them, and uh, he ended up getting them. It was like a, maybe an eight to ten year span after we was together in 89 to him finally getting that uh, I'm about it, about it, and um, you know, how you do that there. He kind of bit that from MC Bleed, but that's when I seen him start, starting to bubble. It was kind of like a little bit surreal because I seen Shaq in that uh, uh, the video or whatever. I was like, okay, he's doing his thing, you know what I'm saying? But I knew he would, would never stop because he never had a regular job, you know what I mean? He's just, always a hustler. He got that bunny, he got the little lawsuit where he did the malpractice suit with his grandfather, you know, which is a sad story, but he took that money and he bubbled it, and he got the he got the uh, no limit store. But it was times when I seen him, and we'd be doing some shows, and um, I go to his crib, and then the next day I come over there, and it's just like totally vacant. I'm like, damn, where he go? And they like, he living in the uh, no limit record store, and that's when Romeo was real young, and I was like, damn, I didn't look down on it. I was like, you know what I mean? It's like. He sacrificed his music, you know what I mean? He kept his credit cool, so he was able to keep moving. But he'd just dip on an apartment and just, you know, do what he had to do, you know what I mean? So I always admire him about that, you know what I mean? So, yeah. How do you think music has changed since the time you were growing up? Man, it changed a lot. It changed a lot. I mean, are they still of, talking about the same stuff, or is, is there a different uh, message in the music today? Yeah, it's just no creativity. I mean, it's like we we'll get a little bit raunchy with it, but you'll be a little bit more discreet. But like, they just out there with it, like you know, the sexy reds. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Pussy booty hole brown. You know what I mean? Y'all, y'all know what the shit is, but it's just like. A little bit too much, you know what I mean? Like, I think it's slowly, slowly shifting though. Like me and my son, he, you know, Don Roddy, my son, he, he, he be cooking it up, you know what I mean? But like how they got the, uh, like that with the Rodney and Joe Cooley, you know, the Metro Boomin and Kendrick Lamar, you know, we, we bringing that wave back. So, I mean, we still in it, obviously. You see us in the studio, but uh, yeah, we cooking it up. We got our Muzark. We do our showcases. We showcase people that draw art and then people that do music. You know what I mean? We got our slanging slabs, barbecue, S-L-A-N-G-I-N-G, slabs, S-L-A-B-S, barbecue. You feel me? You can Google us, you know, tap in. We do pop-ups. You know what I'm talking about? So, uh, How'd you get started with barbecuing? Man, I've been doing it for years. So like me being an OG right now, yeah, I, I you know, I got I got blessed by God, you know, I I got a pension right now, you know what I'm talking about. So this is just a little hustle, you know what I mean? I, I kinda 
donate my services to the Slang and Slabs, you know what I'm saying? So yeah, we keeping it moving. <laughs> What's your guys' specialty? Man, we specialize in them. We get our Slang and Slab ribs. And then we got them, uh, we got them drumettes for the chicken. We got whole birds, half birds. We got the red beans and rice, baked beans, potato salad. And um, macaroni and cheese, please believe it. And we're going to kick in with the vegetables. We got the, the green beans and, you know, mixed vegetables coming in there too. We try to crawl before we walk, but we are, we literally growing legs right now. So, yeah, tap in with us. Google that. Slang and Slabs. S-L-A-N-G-I-N-G Slabs. S-L-A-B-S. Please believe it. Barbecue. Get what time is it. dinner? Man, right now. What time we got? <laughs> it's coming. almost 6 o'clock. <laughs> yeah, that sounds uh I've been burning nice. all morning, boy. <laughs> Summertime coming. Yes, sir. Let's talk about a situation um, with In Too Deep. Yeah. Um, what happened with the accident? Man, it's crazy. Right in front of my house, man. Um uh, One and two deep members, Lofty and his wife, may they rest in peace. Yeah, they was coming down my street right here and uh, was crashing to my avalanche, man. It was crazy. Especially with me being an uh, in two deep fan. But yeah, it was a, uh, man, tragic day. Especially being so hip hop, you know what I mean? Mourning, mourning them. But uh, there was just so many people out here at my crib, from Baby Bash to different people from E-40's clique, you know what I mean? It was like tribal drums, DJ. It was crazy. Crazy, man. May they rest in peace, yo. Joy and Tammy battle, you know what I mean? Tragic event. Being this close to hip hop, and then that happened, you know what I mean, but that's crazy. So earlier I asked you about how you got started as a DJ. So what were some of those early experiences like? Did you, you know, was it an older brother that had some turntables or did you go to a party and, you know, see somebody that, you know, was doing it? Or what was that like? Yeah, it was really my pops. You know what I mean, he had went to Vietnam, you know, he came back with a lot of equipment, reverbs, turntables, microphones. He had a big old record collection. So I'm in there, you know, tinkering around with his stuff. And then uh, all of a sudden, we got the Sugar Hill Gang. You know, they come out. And so we emulating all they raps. You know what I mean? And um, we just trying to be like them. Then uh, you got the Jimmy Spicers that came a little bit later with the Super Rhymes, you know what I mean? And then we lead into the Run DMC. We got the Mantronics and the Houdini and all these different groups. So we all trying to like emulate them. So like for Christmas, I get a, um, a Fisher um, boom box. And like I said, it had like the little speakers that came off you know, I had the little main guts, and I came out of that with a quarter and jack, hooked it up to a turntable, and that's where I started DJing. You know what I mean? Mixing a, a tape with a turntable. You know what I mean? Like, me and my homeboys around the way, we started doing little battles. You know what I mean? We started getting a little bit more better what kind equipment. Of battles? You know, battle with the DJs. You know what I mean? We started getting more, you know, better turntables, like the realistic turntables. We had the little Pioneer Mark um, mixer. And then it evolved into the new Mark mixers and we ended up evolving the 12, Technique 1200s as time went by. You know what I mean? But that's, that was like the evolution of us. You know what I mean? As far as DJs, you know what I mean? When I was in high school, I had my little, I graduated to my little, Technique 100s, you know what I mean? We had like created this little group called the Glow Boys. And um, 
I was like a little b boy, so I had my little Puma sweatsuit and my, you know, my Adidas and all that, my, uh, my Puma, um, you know, with the fat laces and this and that. You know, I mean, they've seen I was a b boy, so they kind of set me up where they they put me out in a little mall area where we uh, had a little lunch time. You know, and I set up my little turntables and you know what I mean. I started doing my little Egyptian lover skits and going back and forth. You know what I mean? They was really impressed with that. And then we just kept, I kept DJing parties at my high school after that. You know what I mean? That's how I kept getting bigger and bigger. You know what I mean? And then eventually I met Master P. You know what I mean? So, yeah. As time went on from there, how has DJing changed? Man, it didn't evolve so much as far as the cue points and all the different stuff you could do. Uh, they got the stems where you could, you know, take out the uh, the vocals, the melody, and just have the drums or whatever you want to do. I mean, it's evolved a lot. You know, I mean, I still gravitate towards the vinyl, but um, I upgraded recently. You know what I mean? Got the Rev 7, you know what I mean? So it's like, it's a game changer. It's a game changer, especially got the the rotating platters like the like the old the old school, you know what I mean? It's not just the the old school pioneers where they just, you know, it's got the rotation now, so that's that's a good look too, you know what I mean? What are some things that people get confused about being a DJ? Cause so I shoot a lot of weddings and I'm looking at the DJ setup. Right. And <clears throat> what I realized is that it's not just playing the music. Right. Like, you know, you got to almost host the party in a sense. You know, you got to, you know, have a timeline and communicate to people. And Exactly. So, you know, what are some things that people, you know, kind of get confused about and don't realize, like, how much work actually goes into it? Yeah, it's a lot of work. It's kind of like, you know, reading the crowd. You know what I mean? They'll give you a little playlist. You know what I mean? It's kind of like a little routine, but you still got to know how to, you know, tweak it. You know what I mean? Um, it might be just a bunch of dinner music, and then it leads into the ceremony where you got the bride and groom, and then you got the mother and father, and blah, blah, blah. You got those particular songs, but when it's when it's time for the reception, that's when you want to really warm it up. You know what I mean? Everybody kind of getting their drink on and eating, and you can just see how the the crowd is shifting. And then it's got to do with the time too. It might be like eight, almost nine o'clock. The sun is going down. That's when you start hitting them with the with the cool little bangers. You know what I mean? It's just all kind of like reading the crowd. It's kind of like a little mental telepathy in a way, you know what I mean? Because uh, I don't have so many diverse crowds, you never know what you're going to run into. But I could please them all, you know what I mean? So, yeah. What it's, are your just, it's just a vibe. Just a vibe? Yeah. What are your favorite type of events to DJ? Shit, I like doing... um you know, annual parties for some of my clients that's, you know, around my age. You know what I mean? I know they flavors, like a lot of the 90s R&B, hip-hop. A little earlier, late 80s, you know what I mean? The Tupac and the Tories Biggs, all that. I got a couple gigs coming up pretty soon, and uh, they can send me their playlist, but they really just let me do me because uh, I'm so seasoned in, that, in those areas, you know what I mean? So... I could be so current right now with a lot of shit and old school, like, I, I never really miss a beat, like, you know, I do it all. Are there any type of events you don't really care for? I mean, like I always say, I, I could deal with all the genres of music, but only for a certain amount of time. So, if I DJ some country shit, yeah, I would hang. But I wouldn't really want to do it for four hours. <laughs> the same way with some rock shit. I mean, I can go rock. I can go. I can go all the. I can go reggae. I can go everywhere. Calypso, blues. You know what I mean? I can go jazz. I can go everywhere. If they pay it right, I, I'll tolerate it. <laughs> can you still use those same methods like 
you know, muting the vocals or taking out the uh, melody with uh, those genres of music too, right? Word. Okay. Yeah, I could do it with anything. Yeah, that's interesting yeah. on what that yeah. would sound like. Yeah, that's the evolution of music, man. It's like Eric Sermon said, a lot of people have it, but everybody don't know what to do with it. You know what I mean? But, yeah. yeah. It's crazy. I could take it anywhere I want to and like make my own mixes on the fly. It's like I'm creating my own little little wave while I'm DJing. Just taking out what I want to take out, have a vocal playing on top of some other drums or vice versa. Melody with drums and different vocals. So I'm all over the place with it. You know what I mean? In your opinion, where's hip hop going next? Like I said, I think it's taking that shift back to the 90s with a real hip hop and MCs. But I realized that the uh, industry and all the uh, gatekeepers, you know, control the culture and all that kind of shit. So, I mean, we got YouTube, we got all these different platforms, like, you know, thank God for your platform, or whatever, you know what I mean, Fizzy Films, but uh, yeah, we just gotta do our own shit push our own narrative and endure the music that uplift people and make them feel good. You know what I mean? Not just so, you know, out the gate with the violence, the sex, the drugs, you know what I mean? Like they say, sex, drugs, and rock and roll, but you don't have to always live that shit. Like, if you got kids and want to have grandkids, you got to slow your rope. You know what I mean? Like, there's a lot of young motherfuckers dying, like Richard Price said. <laughs> You don't get old being no fool, so, you know what I mean? Like, y'all gotta slow down, you know what I mean? There's a, there's a lot of young wise men dead in the motherfucker, you know what I mean? That's what Richard Pryor said. You don't get old being no fool, slow that shit down. You know what I mean? You gotta um, think about your future. You got any advice for anyone wanting to get into being a DJ? Yeah. Yeah, um, soak it up, learn how to blend music, learn tempos, don't just be a button pusher, like, I like having buttons, but, uh, GMS, murder ain't shit, G -G GMS, murder ain't shit. Where should like, someone start if they don't have any equipment, and they're, uh, let's say it's someone who's, who's young and doesn't really have any money. Where should they start? Yeah, it's kind of hard to start off. Just get you one little, um, you got to get you a little controller nowadays. You know what I mean? Get you a little low budget controller, learn how to blend music, learn your little tempos. But don't just rely on the buttons. Learn how to scratch and cut and go back and forth, juggle music. You know, I'm like DJ Premier, DJ, you know, um, DJ Scratch, you know what I'm talking about? Uh, uh, you know, the Jazzy Jeffs, Kid Capri's. I, I consider myself on that level. Well, we don't have to use these buttons. We know how to use 1200s and records with needles on them, you know what I mean? So get you, you know, a little controller and maybe get you a turntable and learn how to drop the needle, learn how to needle drop, you know what I mean? Stuff like that, you know what I mean? Learn how to be a real DJ. Yeah. That's what I would recommend to all you youngsters. I got my first grandson. He's going to be a uh, needle dropper. Lavezra, please believe it. <laughs> You're going to teach him the uh, original way. Yes, sir. Okay. He already messing around with it. He ain't even a year and a half yet. The prodigy. Word. So DJ Grandmaster Scratch. The DJ. The pit master. Any other hidden talents that people should know about? What else you got going on that the world should know about? Man, this is that studio, that Aura studio. You know what I mean? I got the Slang and Slabs, the studio, the Musark. I'm wearing a lot of hats, you know what I mean? But uh, yeah, tap in with me. And my son is Don Roddy. That's Don Roddy, my bad. <laughs> I was going to say the Don Prodigy. <laughs> The Don Roddy, you know what I mean? Check him out on the SoundCloud. We've been cooking it up in the studio. So, yeah. 
like I said, the shift is the shift is turning back to that old school. You know what I mean? So uh, check us out. Where can the people find you at? Check me out on that DJ Grandmaster Scratch on that Instagram, that Slangin' Slabs, on that IG. Tap in with my Don Roddy on IG, that Musart on IG, M A Z A R T. You know what I'm talking about? You know what I mean?